Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca. He invented the Inc. Canadian Insider Index, which is used by the Horizons Canadian Insider Index ETF, a 2017 and 2018 Fund Data Fund Grade A Plus award winner. His website, CanadianInsider.com. Welcome back to the show, Ted. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Ted, the G versus D economy. We talked about that last time. Explain what G and D stand for and what's our status with G and D right now? Well, we're using G versus D as our framework to try and assess which assets will perform the best as we work through this COVID-19 debt-ridden economy of ours. And G stands for government-led inflation, okay? Not Goldilocks. That was you know, a couple of decades ago, maybe last decade. No, no. Goldilocks... Uh, we won't be hearing about her too much, I don't think. Uh, G it means government-led inflation economy, where you've got all this government intervention, Ottawa, Washington, now Japan. You know, they've just announced a $1.1 trillion stimulus. So you've got fiscal stimulus, trying to boost the economy, trying to get things going. And, of course, you've got central banks, which you know are always, you know, never have never... Uh, at an interest rate they didn't like to cut. So that's the G economy. But they're up against the D economy, which is the debt-ridden deflationary economy, which is actually the economy that the central banks created, helped to create by keeping interest rates so low and in, you know, in some areas of the world, cut them to negative. And they're surprised that there's lots of debt out there. you know. And these are, these are the people that are in charge of centrally planning the economy these days. So it's We've got two different frameworks that we're trying to assess what kind of economy are we heading towards now. You can make the case we're already in a bit of a de-economy because of the shock from COVID-19. There was a deflation that happened. We did see oil prices actually trade in negative territory in some parts of the market in Mar in April, I believe. So there was there definitely a de-economy out of the gate with this COVID-19 uh, uh, problem that the world's dealing with. But where do we go from here? And we've got this narrative right now, short-term narrative of a melt-up in the markets, but I, you know that, that will burn itself out at some point. Will it, will it go another week? Will it go another day? Will it go another month? I, I don't know, but at some point it'll, it'll run out of steam and there'll be a bit of a, you know, a consolidation or correction. But, but where are we going over the medium term? And that's what we're using our G versus D framework. And if you want to get a little bit more about that, you can take a look at our Inc. Canadian Insider Index presentation. It's a video presentation on our on our Canadian Insider website. It's on our blog section, so you can take a look at that if you want to drill down a little bit. It's not not a not a hard uh, not a hard video to follow, but uh, dr you can drill down a bit more on that. But what we asked last time on the show, Jim, was you know, is it G versus D? What's emerging? What does it look like? And I said, you know, early signs we may be seeing a bit of a G economy, a bit of an inflationary economy. That would be good for cyclical mining stocks. That would be good for for low-cost gold producers. That would be bad for bonds, okay, under normal circumstances where you don't have the Fed buying every bond in sight, okay. But under normal circumstances, it would not be good for bonds. Okay, but we said it was very early. Now, two weeks later, what have we seen? Well, one of the indicators we're looking for is the Canadian Insider Index. It's an inflation-oriented index. It's got a zero... Uh, 0 0.72 uh, correlation with uh, uh, changing inflation expectations, so 72% correlation, higher than the actual, uh, higher than the TSX composite, which is about six, 0 0.67. It's 
since our last show, it has moved up here uh, after today's performance. It's up about oh, 5.7% uh, 5. since our, our show two weeks ago, and that's about double the TSX composite. So that's showing or, or, or signaling an inflationary impulse. But there's even another indicator that your uh, listeners are probably even more familiar with, and that's the silver-gold ratio. And when that's falling, that is good for silver, it usually means there's an inflationary impulse coming because you would tend to favor gold during a deflationary time where it's uh, seen as a more sturdy store of value during very bad, depressing times. Well, the gold, uh, so the gold-silver ratio has been falling. It, it was almost, I think, 125 uh, at the peak here in, uh, in the spring, but it's fallen under 100 now. And that's just uh, recently, and it, uh, today it ticked up a little bit, but uh, the silver-gold ratio is pointing towards a G economy. But, you know, we're not out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination. You know, this, this is still early days in the forces of G versus D. And at this point right now, yes, G is making a comeback because I think it was on its feet uh, when, in March. I think uh, deflationary forces were, uh, were clobbering the global economy. But now all that, all those trillions of dollars, Jim, that, that, that the governments are spending around the world, you know, there's, those dollars are going somewhere and what our indicators are telling us is that they're, they're, they're finding their way into the real economy. Does it mean they're going to be productive, uh, uses of the, uh, uh, you know, of, of taxpayer dollars? No, far from it. As a matter of fact, we don't even, we, unfortunately, we don't have a framework of a Goldilocks, everything's awesome outcome, you know, Maybe we'll get there, you know, maybe at some point. But right now, we're just looking at two different outcomes, neither of which are, I would say, you know, what I would want to pick for my children to have to deal with. But one is deflationary and one is inflationary. And right now, we've seen a few signs in favor of the inflationary outcome. But, you know, we have a, I think, a very hot, summer ahead of us and we'll see you know what transpires over the next few weeks and months what are canadian insiders saying well they've they've put their bets on the g economy that's not too surprising in canada because most of i would say you know our our market is tilted towards growth and would do well under nominal growth what is interesting though in the united states We've also seen insiders in the United States tilt towards those economy-sensitive areas, sort of energy sector, basic materials sector, even, you know, the, the financials. You know, we're seeing some uh, some encouraging signs, although I wouldn't get all overly bullish on U.S. financials just yet. But uh, so we're seeing confirmation down the south of the border, so that's good. You know, normally in the U.S., we... we you know, normally, I mean, let's say, like in the last 10 years, what we see, what we've seen, what we've had to experience it's why our business hasn't really focused a lot on u.s insiders but we're focusing more and more on it now it's they they were just they were just not they were u.s insiders were just happy to take profits for the last 10 years in the u.s market they just couldn't believe i think you know what a great uh, uh gig they were having being able to sell at these inflated uh, prices it was it was a de economy type situation where the economy was kind of lousy. Yeah, it wasn't in a, it wasn't a deflation, but you know, Fed could never reach its targets. But boy, you had a lot of asset price inflation, and uh, there was the insiders were not signaling a lot of opportunity there. I think things are changing in the U.S. Uh, under this regime. If we do get a G economy outcome, uh, an inflationary economy, it's going to be a huge shakeup in the U.S. market. You know, you're going to have to, you're going to see a big rotation out of those big name software stocks, which we would call the economy stocks because they go up when bonds go up. They go up when bond yields go down. So if you're in a depressed, lousy, lousy economy, yet yeah, those mega cap tech names make a lot of sense. They don't make any sense if you've got an inflation. They are not, they are not positioned for inflation. They are positioned for deflation, disinflation. So it, it, the U.S. is going to, we could be seeing a very interesting shakeup of the U.S. market. But in Canada, we're set, ready to go. And for those investors 
who, you know, are, are running a balanced portfolio, you know, who want to balance between D and G. And that's a very good idea because we don't know yet what is going to prevail. You know, you've got bonds and you've got uh, investments that can protect you on the D side. Canadian stocks and Canadian insider stocks are, are, you know, are pretty good for protecting you on the inflationary upside. So we're living in interesting times. And as, uh, as, a, as an investor's confidence of one outcome or the other, you know, firms, as you get, you know, as you have firmer conviction on whether we're heading towards deflation or inflation, you can adjust your uh, portfolio weights accordingly. So, uh, and of course, if you have gold, what you want to do, and gold investors, you want to be looking for those companies that can operate best under those two different uh, environments. Not all gold miners are are equal. Some have high cost structures, and some have low cost structures. In an inflationary environment, you want the gold miners with the low cost structures. In a deflationary environment, they can do wonders for those uh, miners that have uh, high cost structures. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, we're seeing partial reopenings of the Canadian economy that was shut down by the virus crisis. How are Canadian businesses holding up and where do they need help? Well, you know, I mean, we spend most of our total time looking at the public markets and that, that's, a, I think, a different world than Main Street, uh, given, you know, the, the, the waiting uh, Towards mining stocks and apparently now mining the, the mining and basic materials area is even bigger than the energy sector. But uh, you know, I think if we do get this inflationary impulse, uh, it'll be good on balance for Canadian businesses. There'll be, but you know, you've always got winners and losers, and you know, it's it's going to be unfortunate. I think uh, in you know in North America, you know, you're going to have a number of businesses that that don't make it. But you know, I do believe that the federal government. Uh, has, you know, pro- provided, uh, you know, for a significant amount of support to businesses. We'll see if it's enough. We'll see how long the pandemic lasts. If, if we don't get a, a wave in the fall, you know, uh, I'm hopeful. You know, I'm optimistic. But, you know, look, let's, let's not kid ourselves. There's a lot of businesses that won't make it. And it's, it, and that's not just in Canada. So we are, in, you know, there's a lot of euphoria in the market right now because I think people are breathing a sigh of relief that maybe the uh, believing that the worst is over in terms of the pandemic. I'm not sure that's the case, but that's I think there's a narrative going around that that might be the case. You know, but we'll have to see with the you know the fall. You know, we could be right back at this at the fall. Let's hope not. But uh, you know, I think that uh, you know Canadians are a tough uh, breed, and uh, you know. A lot of businesses will surprise and hang in there. And, you know, I think, you know, you, the federal government has done quite a bit, but they may be asked to do more. So don't be surprised, you know, and I think it would be a mistake for politicians in, in Ottawa to believe that they can start berating the federal government because they've spent too much money supporting Canadians and Canadian business. I think there's a lot of, a lot of accountability that Ottawa must, uh, that has to be addressed in Ottawa, but I believe most of that surrounds the handling, the initial handling of the pandemic and the and the mistakes that were made. You know, we need to find out why Ottawa made certain decisions and, you know, why they continue to make mistake after mistake and, and, and it's because it's cost so much money and it's cost a lot of lives. So I think that's really where, uh, you know, you were, you were asking about business and I've kind of ventured here into the political realm. You know, I, unfortunately, I don't think there's, you know, we will have to see how a lot of these businesses, 
evolve and a lot will depend on how public health officials in the different provinces handle things. I have to give uh, the, the BC government uh, a bit of a shout out. I think they did a very good job all things considered. Yes, they made some mistakes. Uh, the public health officer made some mistakes early on, but on balance, she's done a great job, Dr. Bonnie Henry, I think, in that bringing the public along with her and also, you know, working through a fog. I mean, nobody had perfect information about this. And in BC, we managed to keep the construction going. We managed to keep mining going. So, you know, a lot of the BC economy uh, kept humming Whereas other, uh, other they, we went into a, 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 I call it a quasi lockdown early on, and but we're able to keep some 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 core businesses and industries going. Whereas some other provinces waited, and really made some bad decisions. Uh, and uh, you know, and I think about, the, you know, I, I know a lot. There are a lot of fans of, on, of the Ontario Premier, but you know, he too should be held accountable for why he uh, suggested people could go on spring break. Uh, off on their holidays. I mean, that was, uh, that, 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 uh, you know, that was not a good decision. That was not something he should have said. And I think at time he, he should have known not to have said that. And I, so I think he, you know, our elected leaders all have to be held accountable, not just at the federal level, but at the provincial level. And, you know, fortunately in BC, I think on, on balance, uh, they get a passing grade. I'm not sure you can do, you can apply that to most well, I shouldn't say most provinces, but a lot of provinces. One thing I found extraordinary in British Columbia was how the liberal opposition decided that we'll cooperate with the government, whatever we can do to help out instead of criticizing it was help. And for people outside of British Columbia, uh, politics here is a contact sport. <laughs> they, the two sides really do hate each other. So to see that kind of cooperation was extraordinary. Well, it was it was a smart move by the, the the opposition here because now they have more credibility if they you know uh, when they when they go to hold the BC government accountable and if they find something you know that was a mistake they have more credibility on that. But if you're complaining from day one and crying wolf from day one, then you know if there was something really big that you find down the road, well the the public's kind of uh, you know deaf to to that. So. You know that that was a responsible approach from the BC Liberals, and uh, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately in Ottawa, we, we don't, the, the opposition is leaderless right now, and th- that's too bad uh, in one sense. But uh, you know, I think uh, when they haven't, when the when the opposition party, the main op- the Conservatives, do get a new leader, that leader should have a clean slate. So uh, you know, but I w- I would. You know, I would hope that they would take a, a responsible approach and, and and investigate with the decisions that were made, and I, uh, you know, and and sort of getting a bullhorn out, and, a horn out, and 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 flapping on about the debt and the deficit. That's not going to work, you know. People, you know, I I, I just don't think that there's that, that people don't want to hear about that unless uh, you know, unless it, unless the spending gets gets uh, you know carried away. And uh, becomes uh, a political uh, tool for the you know the government to try and get reelected. Well, that's a different story. And um, you know we we could turn that corner, but you have to be responsible in, in criticizing the government ahead of that, so that if there is a problem, if there is a turn, you know that that needs uh, needs uh, to be called out firmly, then you have the credibility to do that. We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. Ted, the Canadian dollar uh, slipped below 70 cents not that long ago. It's gained 5 cents. What's behind that? Well, this is another G versus D economy indicator. We look, we're looking at the U.S. dollar. 
And we've talked about this on on the show before. I I don't you know have a prediction on the, the dollar. Uh, I just want to see which way it's going. And the fact that it's bounced back is positive. It because the the Canadian dollar is sensitive to global to global growth, and it's uh, it's encouraging to see it move up here. So I think that now whether it's sustainable, whether this is just a you know a correction, a bounce, and um, I know every uh, every. Every uh, weekend on This Week in Money, you hear Ross Clark give a, a great technical overview of, of, of where the currency has been and where, it, and where it's likely to go. But, you know, fun, but over, over the, the trend, if the trend, uh, you know, continues to go higher, that would be a, a positive fundamental sign for Canadian stocks. And, uh, you know, that, that would be, a, that would be a, a good development. And, you know, it, you know, I, you often hear, uh, uh, politicians who really, you know, have no clue what they're talking about on this front. That you know, a, a, a weak Canadian dollar is good because it makes our 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 businesses and more competitive. You know, it does nothing of the sort. It's like, you know, it, it's 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 handing someone who's been hit by a car in the middle of the street, you know, a crutch. You know, it's it's not uh, not going to do much uh, much long term um, uh, good. So. No, we want to see a Canadian dollar move up for the right reasons. We don't want to get carried away, of course, on speculation. Then that's a, then that's a, you know that's a selling opportunity at some point. You want to listen to Ross Clark and find out when that you know those opportunities uh, arrive. But um, you know we want we'd like to see it uh, uh, move up. Uh, that would be that would be good, that would be good news. You know, again, uh, on the assumption that we really don't have a lot of good out, uh, uh, possible outcomes here, we just have. Um, we just have G versus D. Ted, would uh, the increasing price of oil also been a big help to the Canuck buck? Well, that that has been one of the drivers, and and you know the, you would expect the energy market to reflect any inflationary impulse, and that's why one reason why Canadian stocks can help can help uh, hedge against an inflationary outcome because you do have the energy sector in there that you know that would give Canadian stocks a lift if you've got an inflationary impulse. So yes, absolutely the. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an uptick in the oil price. Now we have to see again how sustainable it is. You've got, you, there's no shortage of bears uh, out there on the internet and various uh, publications. Uh, you know that are predicting uh, you know a gloom uh, a gloomy reversal uh, across the, you know in Canada and around the world. And you know that that may pan out. Look, we we you know we're we're in a, we're in we're in uh, you know very strange and distinct times here so no one's got a playbook on how this is uh how this will work out that's why you need a framework to assess how things are working out and that's why we're looking at g versus d you know are we are we are we stuck in d deflation or are we heading towards g and you know so uh, stronger oil prices that's g stronger canadian dollar that's g you know if uh, if we can if we if we were to see interest rates continue to head lower that would be d Right, so favoring bonds. So right now, okay for Canadian stocks, but you know, let's see as we head into this hot summer where we're probably going to have continued social unrest in the United States. You know, let's see how that shakes out. You know, and how that plays out, and and how the COVID nineteen numbers play out. So you know, I, I think this rally is will be due for a pause. It'll get some news that will that will that will put you know that will stop this 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 stock market rally in its tracks temporarily. Then the question is, does it head back down or does it? Or does it uh, move up higher into the uh, into the fall as we head towards the U.S. election? Ted, thank you so much for chatting with us. Well, thanks for having me back. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, his website, CanadianInsider.com. If you have any questions for Ted or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter, at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.